The island of Sodor is surrounded by a beautiful blue sea. It has fields of green and sandy yellow beaches. There are rivers, streams, and lots of trees where the birds sing. There are windmills, and a coal mine, and docks where the visitors to the island arrive. The island also has lots and lots of railway lines. Who's that puffing down the track? It's Thomas! Hello, Thomas! Well, what's with this intro? Can we please get into the video already? Okay, alright, then where do you suggest we start? Well, you could start with how you built me. Just admire my six small wheels, and my short stumpy boiler, and my short stumpy funnel, and my short stumpy dumb. Of course. Alright, let's just jump into it. While creating my Thomas model, I had a lot of people ask me a lot of questions that, honestly, I couldn't keep up with. So I'm making this video today to hopefully answer all the questions anybody has ever asked, or any future questions that anybody could ask. But first, I wanted to give a little insight in what inspired me to make this Thomas model in the first place. Back in December of 2020, I was going through a lot of mental stress. I don't know what clicked in my mind, but I decided to go to a place where I remember being the most happy lass, and that was watching Thomas and Friends. I remember Thomas the Tank Engine making me so happy as a kid, and giving me this feeling of safety and security and overall happiness. So at a time where I needed it most, I decided to look back at my childhood. I don't want to go in too much depth, but basically, I started liking Thomas again. It started out as a secret, but then became almost something that I couldn't keep out of the public eye. And honestly, I think I'm going to tell that story another day. While I scrolled through YouTube watching old season 8, 9, and 10 episodes, I started to find out a little bit more about Thomas the Tank Engine, mainly the models themselves. I found out through a video from Train Boy that the Thomas models have actually quite a lot of history to them. I knew nothing about Gage 1, I knew nothing about Thomas model making, and I had no idea how any of this stuff huh? was made, but I decided to look into it. After doing a little bit of scoundering on YouTube, I figured out that people People were making homemade replicas of these models that were shown on TV. Some of them were pretty good and some of them were not that bad. And a lot of them, they just inspired me to make something of my very own. So I ran down to my local Home Depot, grabbed a few supplies, a couple of spray paints, and made a Thomas model made of cardboard. Now this model wasn't any particular gauge or size, it was just something that I decided to make for fun, and it took me about three days to make. As you can see, it isn't the best thing in the world, but it's something that I was proud of at the time. I still wanted more, I wanted to do something better. That's when I decided to make my first Gage 1 Thomas model. Now this first Gage 1 Thomas model was made entirely of acrylic cut plastic and a few parts ordered from Shapeways. These parts were not cut by any special laser, it was done completely by hand, and this model, by the time it was complete, it was something I was also extremely proud of, more proud of than the last model I made. Unfortunately, I have absolutely no pictures of me putting this model together because this was still at a time where liking Thomas was something that I kept to myself, I kept secret. And if anybody asked, I just said that I liked the idea of locomotives and not Thomas specifically. I still wasn't satisfied. It was done, I looked at it, it was completed, and I pondered for weeks and weeks and weeks until my girlfriend finally convinced me to buy a 3D printer to complete my next Gage 1 Thomas. And of course, this was my first 3D printer I've ever owned, and this was my first time working with 3D printed parts of my very own, so I just went on Thingiverse, scrapped up a couple of files that I can find, put it together and this model was bad. It was very bad. I didn't like it. It was very, very, very bad. But at the time, I, I it was just clunky. I thought it was good, but I, 
It was, it was bad. It was very bad. After Thomas Mach 1 was eventually turned to scrap, I decided that it was time to put together a Thomas model that was sensible and easy to make. Now, before I get into how I made this Thomas model, I'm gonna list off pretty much all the parts, including electronics that I used to have a complete version of my model. Tamiya White Putty, Mr. Liquid Surfacer 500, Sandpaper, Grits 120 through 600, Mr. Surfacer Spray, Mr. Surface Primer, Pink or White, TS10, TS23, Automotive Pinstripe Tape, Rust-Oleum Black, Rust-Oleum Enamel, PS2, Yellow and Red Vinyl, Gold Rust-Oleum, Gray Spray Paint of Choice, Hot Glue, 5mm Brass Tubes. A lot of people make their models out of different materials. I made mine out of 3D printed parts so that I don't have to worry about measurements and specifics and down to the certain millimeter, which is something that is very important and I'll get to later. Some people, as mentioned before, used acrylic cut parts, either laser cut or hand cut. And there are a lot of people who hand cut their acrylic really well, Nicholas being one of them, go follow him, he's amazing. And quite a few people like Kovi and fake rail fan who have laser cut acrylic parts. Some people decide to also make their models out of brass. T-Doc 41 being one of the most impressive brass Duncan models I've ever seen. Once you figure out exactly what your model is going to be made out of, it's time to start making this thing happen. As you all know, my Thomas model is 3D printed. The first set of Thomas files I used were actually made by me. I used reference pictures of Thomas's CGI model and his brass model. And any Thomas aficionado can tell you that that is by far the worst thing to use as reference. And I didn't know that at the time. After the train wreck <laughs> that was Thomas Mach 1, I decided that the easiest course of action when it comes to painting my completed model would be making my Thomas model in separate parts. And I highly recommend it to any new model makers. So from the Thomas files that I created, I sliced Thomas's smoke box, body, running boards, splashers, and chassis into all separate pieces. Disclaimer before I continue any further, you will mess up a lot you will struggle with a lot of things you're new to. If you're brand new to model making, and if you fuck up so many times, get used to it. It's gonna happen, it happens to me, it happened to me, it happens to everyone. A lot of people don't post their fuck ups, a lot of people don't post how many times they mess up, and they wanna seem like perfect individuals. That's not real life. It is okay to mess up. It is okay to restart and keep trying. Believe in yourself, for the love of God. So as far as I knew, these Thomas files were as accurate as they'd get ever since I didn't know where to find any other Thomas files. So after they were freshly printed right off the print bed, it was time for sanding. This is when I decided to use 150 grit sandpaper to sand the living bejesus off of the fresh prints. As anyone knows with a regular PLA printer, fresh prints have what are called layer lines. Layer lines are very ugly, very disgusting, and things that need to be gone in order to have a nice, smooth end result with your model. After Thomas's body was nice and sanded, it was time to fill in any cracks or blemishes with Mr. Gray Putty or whatever the fuck it's called and fill in any cracks or blemishes. Lucky for me, the back of Thomas's bunker was completely lifted due to the fact that I had a rubber printing bed instead of a glass one. And if you don't know, glass beds help distribute heat and pretty much keep everything in order when it comes to printing, especially big, flat objects. Of course, silly old me didn't know that at the time, and as a result, Thomas's back bunker was lifting, so I had to cut off Thomas's ass with a Dremel and print him a new one and glue it onto the back. Now that all the cracks were filled in with Mr. Gray Putty, still don't know what the fuck it's called, now it's time to sand off all the imperfections of those cracks and give it a quick coat of Mr. Surfacer 1000. Now, this first coat of Mr. Surfacer is gonna wanna be a very thick coat. Uh, I suggest spraying a lot of it on, letting it dry for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then sanding the living life out of it with 150 grit sandpaper. After sanding off any visible remnants of Mr. Surfacer spray, 
what I use is Mr. Liquid Surfacer 500 and fill in any visible cracks. Give the model one more quick spray of Mr. Surfacer 1000 and sand and sand and sand and sand and sand more, sand it again, sand a little bit more, and then sand it one more time. Basically sand it until the thing is as smooth as an infant's behind. Alright, I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. There is a specific method I use to sand my models for the last time. It's called water sanding. It's when you finish sanding off your model, and while it still has those dust particles still on it, and you take a little bit of water on your sandpaper and rub your model in circles with the wet sandpaper, and what this does is take all those loose particles and put them in the place of potential scratches or tiny holes that you possibly can't see until when your model is complete. And this results in a very smooth, clean finish. Okay, so you're ready to start painting your model. Now, I'm gonna assume you're following along with the video and you're making a Thomas. That's perfectly fine. But before you apply the blue to the gray model you have now, you're going to wanna put a surface primer on it so that the color blue really pops. Now, I've had struggles in the past with what blue I'm gonna use and I found out best that mixing TS-23 and TS-10 are the sweet spot. I didn't just use TS-23 or TS-10. TS-23 has this greenish teal type undertone that just wasn't Thomas, and TS-10 was too dark and it just didn't seem like Thomas, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. What you're gonna wanna do is prime your model in a bright, vibrant color, preferably pink, or if you don't have pink, white is perfectly fine. Now, to achieve the perfect Thomas Blue, what I did was apply TS-23, about two to three coats of TS-23 to cover the entire model, and since Tamiya paints are very thin and the underlying coat affects the top coat, I applied TS-10 on top of that. And as you see, it resulted in by far the best blue that Thomas could possibly be. His smoke box, roof, and chassis are all black, so I wasn't about to spend four and a half thousand dollars on a tiny ass can. So I just bought Rust-Oleum, sprayed those black. After it dried, it got a clear coat of either matte or satin or whatever I decided to use at the time. And there you have it. Oh, most of your stuff is painted. Now, I cannot stress this enough. Let the paint dry for more than 24 hours. If you don't let the paint dry for more than 24 hours, when you apply the lining or any other details, you'll end up ripping up the wet paint because it may look dry in the surface and it may seem dry when you touch it, but underneath the paint is still wet. And if you mess with it heavily, like applying details or lining, you will rip up the paint and you'll have to redo the entire process. can be kind of boring to wait for Thomas parts to finish drying while they're freshly painted, but this is what I like to take the time and print out smaller details like his buffers, lamp irons, couplings, whistles, whatever. I have successfully printed all of his details in regular PLA and they turned it out okay, I guess? But then it was about time when I decided to make this new model, I decided to print all the smaller details in resin, which I can tell you, it, it's a life changer. It really is. Eventually. Okay, so it's been 36 hours and you're now excited to start detailing this Thomas model so that it can really start looking like your favorite little blue puffball. I suggest starting somewhere where it matters most and that is his red lining. His red lining is honestly just red automotive pinstripe tape. Thomas's lining is pretty straightforward. It's nothing but straight lines, corners, and squares besides the splashers. Splashers is different. It's a curve and a lot of people struggle with curves. So I have the exact method to help you with that. Thomas's curves are made by the same pinstriping. So don't go on painting them on or whatever. My method is take a, as more pinstripe tape than you need. Have a bit of pinstripe tape overhang and put your thumb down and hold it and Almost stretch out the pinstripe tape. Not too much, but you wanna tighten it. And add, hold your thumb and press it around 
with the curve so that it lays down flat. Pinstripe tape is very, what's the word, influential. If you tell it to do something, it'll do it. Probably not for long, which is why you gotta be kinda quick with this. After you lay down the pinstripe taping on Thomas's splasher, I recommend using a blow dryer or some kind of heat source. Not a microwave, for the love of God, do not use a microwave. You will, prison time, it's, prison time will is what you will serve if you put that thing in a microwave. I swear to God, if you put that thing in a microwave, I swear to God, if I find out anybody put any part of their Thomas in a microwave, the oven, the toaster oven, the toaster, I swear to God, I'm gonna find your address if you put that in a microwave. What this is gonna do is really lay down the pinstripe tape and get rid of all those nasty bubbles and cracks and curves. <laughs> and bam, there you got it, it's magic. Thomas's yellow pinstriping around his cab windows are thinner than his red lining. I don't know about you guys, but I have never found one millimeter pinstripe tape. So what I did was I bought a paper cutter off of Amazon and some yellow vinyl. And this yellow vinyl is a very palish yellow, but it's a really good yellow for Thomas. All I did was measure out a millimeter and cut little strips out of it and it worked as good as gold. Now, I know full well that some people prefer the back lining that was on the classic series Thomas, but for the fact that I went for a full hit era look, I didn't add back lining. So after the lining is now for the numbers. The numbers, you can get someone to Cricut cut them. You can find them online. I don't know how anybody's gonna do it. I just use custom cut vinyl stickers. I used red and the same yellow I used on his cab windows and just free balled it, I guess, and just cut out a number one. You've got a number one now. Are you proud? A lot of people have the body built all as one piece, or they have the body and running board separate, but as you know, my entire model is built in separate pieces, and it's all held together by hot glue. All right, so let me explain the chassis real quick before we step into the electronic. Your chassis block is by far the most important part of your entire model if it plans on running. The chassis is mostly 3D printed. The wheels, the side rods, and the main block itself, all out of PLA. The Eclipse, the axles, and the bearings are all metal parts that you can easily find on Amazon. I found that placing ball bearings onto the axles of Thomas's chassis provide a quiet and smoother running experience because, well, if you know anything about what ball bearings do, they're amazing for this type of thing, and I don't recommend making a chassis without it. Again, since my Thomas is RC powered and not track powered, everything is powered off of the same 7.4 volt battery. The motor is connected to a speed controller and that speed controller is connected to both the receiver and the power supply, AKA the lithium battery. The receiver is also connected to the two servos that control the eyes. If you've seen any of Train Boy's videos, you know that making the eyes move are as simple as two servos stacked on top of each other. One for up and down movement and one for left and right movement. Now, there's this metal bracket that you'll have to glue onto the servo that moves left and right that'll stick into the back bracket of the eye. Here's a little side note. For any faces that you wanna use for a potential eye mechanism on your model, you're gonna have to dremel out the back to accommodate the eye bracket thing. This thing, this thing. You need, you're gonna need to drum a lot of the space so that the face can actually fit onto the smoke box. He's a really useful engine, you know. All the other engines, they'll tell you so. He huffs and puffs and whistles, rushing to and fro. He's the really useful engine we adore. He's the one, he's the one, he's the really useful engine that we adore. He's the one, he's the man, the tank engine. Oh, you must be the new number one. I'm Thomas. Well, look after the branch line, Thomas, and wear that number with pride. Don't worry, Mr. Coffee Pot. I will. You can count on me. Uh, but uh, I'm not Mr. Coffee Pot. My name is Glenn. <laughs> He's a really useful engine, you know. 
the top of the hat, well, he told him so. Now he's got a branch line to call his very own. He is the really useful engine we adore. I just want to say thank you to pretty much everybody that I'm mentioning here. It's just not only for helping with this model, but the support and guiding me throughout this entire journey making this model. It's just, I couldn't have done anything without you guys. And it's, I, I can't thank you enough. I really can't. I, I really can't. I try, but I, I just can't. Come on now. He's the one. He's the one. He's the really useful engine.